Hey Thrivers, you're listening to episode number 17. Today we're getting serious. I'm talking to an awesome working mom about a topic that's not always easy for women to share about. My dear friend Megan Dunn is here to get real with us about the darker side of pregnancy and her battle with postpartum depression. Whether you're a fellow mom or you don't yet have kids, I'm excited to shed light on an issue that affects every one out of nine women. Postpartum depression can rear its head in various ways and affects each mother differently. So today, Meg will be sharing with us some of the warning signs and how we can support our friends and loved ones during the postpartum days. We'll also be talking about where she's at now and how her postpartum struggle shifted her outlook on motherhood and relationships. Keep listening as we get real and talk about the roller coaster ride of pregnancy and what many refer to as the fourth trimester or postpartum period. Welcome to The Thrive, a podcast for working moms. This is for all the women and moms listening. If you work from home, in an office, run your own business, or are the CEO of your family, this podcast is for you. Because at the end of the day, all moms are working moms. Rachel and Christine invite you to celebrate the victories, get advice, listen to their mom fails, and to know you aren't alone, to thrive in your everyday life. Today's episode is sponsored by The Salted Apron. As working moms, we are open about the need to ask for help from time to time, and personal chef Hillary Prickett started The Salted Apron to do just that. Whether you're in need of help with meal prep or catering for a dinner party or an at-home event, Hillary offers customized, creative menus accommodating all dietary restrictions and preferences. The Salted Apron uses fresh, local ingredients from farmers and artisans right here in Lancaster, PA, and can help you create a meal plan that's just right for your family so you can say goodbye to takeout. From monthly freezer stock-ups to freshly prepared meals, The Salted Apron has options for every busy mom. For a unique culinary experience, Hillary will cook for your date night in, dinner party, or small celebration in the comfort of your home, allowing you to become a guest at your own party. To learn more, follow at The Salted Apron on Instagram and find Hillary on Facebook at The Salted Apron or email The Salted Apron at gmail.com. Hey Thrivers, you're listening to season two, episode number 17. Today, I'm really excited to have with me a good friend and just a special guest today. Her name is Megan Dunn. Hi. <laughs> Say hi. Hi, I'm not sure when I'm supposed to start talking or not, but hi. <laughs> uh, Meg is here to share with us her, preg- her pregnancy story and just her journey after pregnancy with postpartum and some of the ups and downs that we haven't touched base on yet because Christine and I have shared, obviously, um, throughout the past handful of months about the feelings we were having just as our bodies were growing and changing and how we were feeling emotionally, but we haven't shared so much on the darker and deeper side of things, um, the emotional part of each woman's journey, and statistically, 80% of women have the baby blues after having a child. And I've talked a little bit about my experience with that, and I recently learned that up to one out of nine women actually suffer from clinical postpartum depression, which is a little more serious than the baby blues. In fact, in many cases, it can be really scary. So that's what you're going to talk to us about, right? Yes, I am. So keep listening. We're really excited to just um, just be honest and open today about the ups and downs that happen. So can you share with us a little bit about just who you are, how old your son is now? Sure, of course. Um, so I am... Um, working as a nurse, I'm a mom of one, so I work three days a week, and then the rest of the time I pretty much spend with my three and a half year old um, little boy, Miles. And so hopefully you won't hear from him too much while we're recording because he <laughs> is hanging out with us right now. Um, but I um, was previously married um, and in a long term relationship, which is where Miles came out of. Um, and then you know things changed, and now it's kind of the two of us. And then. Uh, my boyfriend Pete, who plays a really big part in where I'm at today. Um, yeah. But yeah, so my experience with postpartum depression and anxiety kind of goes back before I was even pregnant with Miles, mm-hmm. um, which is kind of maybe a different, um, a different thing that you would hear a lot of women say. But yeah, I I knew 
that I was going to be at risk for it. Um, when I was in fifth grade, sixth grade, you know, when all of us are starting to go through puberty, I was running a little behind schedule, you know, from all the other girls. But I noticed around that time that something was a little bit different for me. Um, I just wasn't feeling as excited and happy as a lot of the other girls. And I started early on with depression and anxiety, but I didn't really know, you know, what it was at, at that point. Right. Later on, you know, I would have been treated um, in different settings and clinical settings for it. So going into pregnancy, I knew that I was going to be at risk. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really comprehend at that time how at risk I was going to be, but I, it was in the back of my mind that it, you know, would yeah. be something that would possibly happen to me and mm -hmm. with my pregnancies. And that's interesting that you bring that up because I also feel like before I was diagnosed with anxiety, like I just didn't really know what it was. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that much about it. And I always just thought it was physical stuff for me. Like I remember taking like, uh, what is that for? Like acid reflux. I took a medicine for that because I thought I was just having stomach issues. Yeah. And then after years of dealing with like these so-called stomach issues, I finally went to a doctor who was like, are you feeling like a little nervous? Like, how are you feeling at night? Are you sleeping okay? And it took those questions for me to realize like, you know, maybe I'm causing these stomach issues on my own. Like I, I am feeling anxious. No one had ever asked me that before. It took, it took for me like, um, how many years? I don't know. But I was in college um, when we finally figured out, like, anxiety was my issue. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of – I don't know if it's a good thing that you were able to recognize it a little earlier. But I definitely think that just recognizing your tendencies before going into pregnancy um, can definitely give you a heads up as to, you know – what you might be like after the baby comes right. as far as like what your risk factors and things are. Um, because I was a little worried knowing that I was on medicine, um, mm -hmm. getting pregnant the first time they took me off of it. And from there it was, it was kind of a roller coaster. Um, so when you found out you were pregnant, walk us through that a little bit. So I had had my miscarriage first. And even before that, I was not really sure that I wanted or was ready to have children. I always knew I wanted to be a mom, but I wasn't sure that I was ready to have children at that time. But, you know, things happened, and I got pregnant, and a few months after, miscarried. And um, it was extremely traumatic for me. Um, I never thought that would happen to me, but it put me in this mindset that I was ready to be a mom, and I knew. So I was on a mission to get pregnant. So... My pregnancy with Miles was very intentional. I was so excited. Um, mm -hmm. I had always seen myself having a big family because I came from a smaller family. And so my pregnancy was um, very intentional and I was so excited. We were so excited. Uh, and we had friends and family and people that were super supportive of us um, that um, really kind of pushed me along the way. I think I nested for like nine months. <laughs> we, we had bought a house. We moved into the house. And um, so I kind of was moving into the home and getting everything in its right place. And so I was also working like almost 60 hours a week and two different jobs. I had a nursing floor job. And then I was teaching also at a local um, community college for their nursing program uh, while pregnant. I forgot um, how busy you were. I was so busy. I mean, I was just my, I was dead set on moving out of my apartment and into this house and filling this house. So it was ready to go, mm -hmm. you know, come November 9th, which we know anything about first time moms you you know a lot of the times baby doesn't come on the due date and miles miles came at 41 and five days oh. well technically 40 42 days if you want to count you know the long induction but um <laughs> yeah it was it was crazy but um my my I had like very minimal complications with my pregnancy. Mm -hmm. I and when I say complications, I don't mean like um, like I had to go to the hospital really for anything. I, I had one preterm labor scare that was super minimal. I worked like twelve hours and I was dehydrated, and so I just cramped up a bit. But otherwise, you know, it was not that exciting. I had a lot of carpal tunnel issues because I was so swollen. I, I stand 4'11", oh. and so just all that extra baby weight and all the extra 
um, you know, blood and fluid in my body. I'm going to try not to be a nurse on this show. <laughs> yeah. But all that extra stuff that goes on um, when you're pregnant, just I had pinched nerves and um, pinched vessels in my arms. So my hands were so numb. And I just remember telling them that 38 weeks, I said, can you please just get him out? <laughs> Me, I was like, can I just get induced? And they're like, no, he's happy in there. He's happy. So mm -hmm. he stayed in there. And I was I was tired of, of being pregnant around like 36 weeks. I was ready. But oh, yeah. yeah, other than that, I mean, I can't say that my pregnancy was like, you know, difficult or I, I loved being pregnant. Were you on any anxiety meds during your pregnancy? No. No. So I had been on a lot of um, medications for like mood stabilizers for some of my anxiety mm -hmm. and mental health problems prior. And then I had been on um, an SSRI or an antidepressant for about, oh gosh, it must have been almost 12 years. But I was on the specific one I was on for six years and I had gone off of that a couple years before. Mm -hmm. um, and that was not with the doctor's order or guidance. I just was like, I'm done. I mm -hmm. think I'm good. I don't need to do this anymore. Um, so I, you know, had this idea in my head that I had been cured and I'm fine. Um, I had not been cured. <laughs> Plot twist. I had not been cured. I think um, it's something that you just, if you have it, I don't think you're ever fully cured of you're it. You're not. You know, I just feel like anxiety is something I'm always going to have to deal with, but I can learn better ways to cope with it. Yeah. Um, but I just wanted to know what you did during your pregnancy because they, yeah, switching me through, like throughout my first pregnancy, like really threw me off. Yeah. I, I would, I was not on anything. I was taking okay. a multivitamin and iron and that is about it. I was not taking anything for depression or anxiety. But and you I felt pretty good. I felt great. I was just on this like pregnancy high, like um, I didn't have crazy mood swings. I, I did have a pretty bad morning sickness the entire, like 24 mm -hmm. seven, the entire pregnancy up until the day I delivered. Um, but otherwise, no, I, I felt good. And I think I had a mission that whole time. I think I was very driven because I had these things in my mind that I needed to get done. Yeah. And I had the ideas and the plan in my head of how I was going to go about doing it. And so I was very occupied Mm -hmm. Um, I think too, because you would have your miscarriage, you were very like, this pregnancy is going to happen. Yes. And like, I'm going to do everything right this time. And yep. that, you know, I'm going to be positive. I'm going to read all the books. I'm going to get everything ready. I read all the books. I mean, from Dr. Sears to, you know, baby wise, I uh -huh. was going to be the most ready mom ever. And I think that's also, that's not just my personality, but it's part of being a nurse too, mm -hmm. um, is knowing what's going to happen you know, five steps ahead, being five steps ahead at all times, you right. know, it's, you know, you are ready and you're type A and everything is just like you are planning for everything. And when something goes wrong, then you, you already have like six backup plans. Like it's mm -hmm. not a big deal. Yeah. Um, and so I, I was just dead set on this is how it's going to go. And in the back of my mind, I had always heard people saying, um, you know, like, it's not going to go as you planned. Like, be flexible, you know? like. Mm -hmm. And so in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll be so flexible. I will be the most flexible. You know, this isn't going to go exactly the way I want, but it's going to be great anyways. It's going to be just the best. Yeah. You know? Disclaimer. Just ignore any background noise this episode. We're recording with a baby and a three-year-old. Oh, yeah, Who are doing pretty good so far. But if you hear, like, a... Like a sucking? It's not me. It's not. It's, it's me either. Running. Yep. It's me either. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, yeah, my pregnancy was really great. So what happened during labor? Did things go as planned? <sighs> okay. No, not at all. Nothing is went as Is this where things changed? This is where everything changed. So my labor did not go well. First of all, Miles did not want to come out. Um, so I ended up being induced at 41 and 5. Um, that's 41 weeks and five days. Um, and so I went in around lunchtime. Um, I literally went from my OBGYN's office where they did the, a non-stress test. And I literally walked over mm -hmm. and got myself checked in at the hospital where I delivered. Um, and I had a big lunch. They said, eat a nice big lunch, you know, get like hydrated. And I 
I have to also say I was not going to do my labor and delivery experience with any sort of medications or epidurals. I had that in my head. I had flashcards of, I was, I was like Leslie Nope from Parks and Recreation. Like I had flashcards and binders of all the motivational stuff that I was going to look at when I was, you know, Oh my gosh. I'm not, I'm serious. I'm Leslie Nope, by the way. Like I was... I was ready. I had my bouncy ball. I had images of myself going to like, you know, be in the whirlpool tub, you know, this, I was going to do this without medication and I was going to do it without any medication. So I opted for the, (laughs) I opted for the Foley balloon induction. And I don't know if you know what that is, but basically they uh, put a couple balloons uh, around your cervix. Like they, it's inserted um, when it's deflated, one goes up above the cervix inside, like right touching the uh, amniotic sac. And the other one is on the outside of the cervix. So it kind of like makes a sandwich out of your cervix. Ah, and then I they, think I know what you're talking about. They tried yeah. that for me with yes. one induction and I just wasn't having it. They couldn't get it in the right yeah. way. So yeah. So they, they inflate the balloons in there and it puts pressure mm-hmm. on the cervix. And over time, it's supposed to naturally dilate you, that okay. pressure. And when you get to, I think, four or five centimeters, it should fall out because okay. it's that small. So I had this thing in for 12 hours. They leave it in for 12 hours or let it fall out of its own. I had it in for 12 hours and they took it out and I was one centimeter still. Oh. Yeah. No, I went nowhere after 12 hours. So it was about midnight. They said, we're going to strip your membranes. They stripped my membranes. They broke my water. Nothing happened. Nothing at all. Um, they started Pitocin and nothing happened except for I was uncomfortable and because nothing was happening they pretty much got to the point through the next morning where we had the Pitocin turned up almost the entire way and I was almost maxed out and I felt like a train was running me over you Mm -hmm. know it was unbearable I was I was not expecting it and it wasn't that it didn't seem like a gradual (laughs) increase to me at the time like I didn't feel like oh we're gonna just increase it a little bit more now Mm -hmm. I felt like I went from like zero to 500 like that Mm -hmm. um and my flashcards and my binders meant nothing at that point you know like it went it meant nothing um you were like give me all the drugs I give me all the things here's the thing I was so (laughs) stubborn and I was so fixated on my mission that I let them give me one two doses technically two doses of a pain medicine through my IV which got me about 45 minutes of sleep and okay. and then it wore off. And so then, yeah, it was a mess. I said, you got to turn this stuff off. I can't take this any longer. Mm-hmm. And there had been a little bit of iffy stuff happening on the heart monitor for him. So they turned it off and gave me a little break and they kept offering that epidural idea since I was, you know, still like two centimeters at this time. I was nowhere. I had oh not my progressed. Goodness. I didn't nowhere. realize it took this long. Yes. Nowhere. So the, you know, that also made it really difficult because I was starting to feel super, um, discouraged. Like, why is my body not doing this? This is a natural process. You know, why is my body not doing this? It is doing this, doing this. Um, I just felt like I was like feeling as a woman, you know? So my body was not working out the way that. I knew it should. I even watched, there was this documentary on like, ho- like home births and natural births and stuff at this one point that I watched. Uh-huh. I totally, you know, I had this idea in my head that I needed to do this a certain way and that my body would just know what it was doing mm-hmm. and uh, mine did not. It was, in, you know, it was not doing what I wanted. Long story short, I had, uh, they turned up the Pitocin. I had another run in with uh, Miles' heart rate dropping to the point where they couldn't find it anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, So they stopped the Pitocin. They put the epidural in after they got the heart rate back um, so that if they needed to take me for an emergency C-section, they wouldn't have to put me asleep and put a breathing tube in. I could just go and have a C-section done Mm -hmm. because I did not want to be drugged up when he came out, I wanted to be present, um, and awake and aware when he was born. I wanted to, you know, hear his first cry and see him. So, of course, nothing went the way that I wanted, and I ended up having the emergency C-section. Um, and so it was about 31 hours of this whole experience before Miles finally came out. And I guess he had been stuck in my pelvis, like, sideways, so his head never, like, descended properly. I guess mm-hmm. they could feel it, but it was, like, 
not in the right spot. So I'm not gotcha. sure if somebody dropped the ball on that one or not, or if they just he thought just he moved, would change. thought he yeah. would move, thought he would change, but. I didn't know what was going on. I certainly just thought that it was, you know, my body not, mm-hmm. you know, knowing what it was doing. And I felt super deficient and, like, bad about myself with that, too. Like, I felt like, and, and this is not how it is, by the way, but I felt at the time like I cheated by having a C-section. Like, I was weaker and I had less um, strength as a woman. Like, I, you know, and I we did it because we both needed to survive. Like I needed to survive and Miles needed to survive. And if we hadn't done it this way, he would have probably gone into more fetal distress and and I wouldn't have had a baby. So it was necessary, but it was very heartbreaking. Yeah. And and you had planned on it in your head a certain way. Exactly. And I'm the type of person that, you know, when things don't go my way, sometimes I just, I feel devastated. And I feel like it's as a result of, of something that I did wrong, which also comes back to my depression and anxiety where I just fixate on like how I could have done something different. And I take a lot of things to heart and take them personally. And then I just kind of stew in them sometimes. And that's, you know, something that over time I've learned to deal with and learned to work on, but mm-hmm. I didn't have the tools at this point to do that yet. Um, so my labor was tough. And from the, the second that Miles came out, he was not a sleeper. He came out eyes wide open, mm-hmm. scowling at the world, and he <laughs> was not going to sleep. He was not going to sleep. Side note, he is the most adorable three-year-old now. <laughs> he's so great. He's very chill, very happy. <laughs> I feel like he's the most polite little thing. I just love him. But he was a difficult baby. He's so easygoing now. And so it's almost like I feel like I'm, I'm like lying or I'm telling somebody else's story when I talk mm-hmm. about what happened because you wouldn't know it now. Why well, have the opposite issue? If I told somebody that Reagan was calm and she <laughs> slept all the time, they'd probably be like, what? I know. You're not talking about like your insane yep. four-year-old, are you? Yep. But no. yeah, it's I get crazy. it. And he's <clears throat> such a good sleeper now. He will sleep like 12 to 14 hours through the night. Oh, you man. know, he'll take naps. When he takes a nap, it's like a three hour like almost all day experience, it feels like I never know what to do with myself yeah, when he takes like the whole afternoon. Oh, it's amazing! I love it so much. <laughs> I love it. It's, you know, it's not every day, but when it happens, yeah. it's it's like vacation. But no, he's such a good kid. As working moms, we all need help getting dinner on the table when life is busy. So we are excited to tell you about today's sponsor, the Salted Apron. Whether you need help with meal prep or catering for a dinner party or an at-home event. The Salted Apron offers customized, creative menus accommodating all dietary restrictions and preferences. Owner and working mom Hillary Prickett uses fresh local ingredients to help you create a meal plan that's right for your family so you can save money on takeout and eat healthier. From monthly freezer stock ups to freshly prepared meals, the Salted Apron has options for every busy mom. To learn more, find the Salted Apron on Instagram and Facebook or email the Salted Apron at gmail.com. So tell us about those early days, though. Early days. So we got home. Well, first, the first few days, when you have a C-section, they want to keep you in the hospital, like, for up to five days. And I mm-hmm. was, I had cabin fever. I'm like, get me out of here. If my child's not going to sleep and he's going to cry um, a lot, uh, I would rather just be at home. And mm-hmm. I, I, looking back, wish I would have stayed longer so that I could send him to the nursery for a nap. But we got home and, um, you know... I didn't really know what to expect. It was like all of a sudden everything that I had read and watched went out the window. Um, I was so happy to have a baby and I just remember feeling such intense love for him and at the time so much joy. Um, You know, I felt love for my husband at the time, you know, the way that he would, uh, was so quick to take care of Miles and so quick to, you know, jump into that father role. so I, I had a lot of excitement and joy coming home. Um, the first week, because of my uh, C-section, I was on some pain medication that made me feel pretty good. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I did not want to take it because I had been I was breastfeeding, but they 
convinced me at the time that like it was such a small amount it was totally safe and and Mm -hmm. Miles wasn't sleeping anyway so you know I kind of after a while going up and down the stairs in our bi-level home Mm -hmm. I was just like I need something else so yeah um so you know I was on the the medication um for about five days and things were okay things were okay we had visitors people were bringing stuff by um I'd say for me, uh, about a week in, I started experiencing what I thought was the baby blues. Mm -hmm. Um, I was not necessarily crying a lot, but I just felt so sad. Um, I'm an angry crier, so I just felt so sad and like, I just wanted to be left alone. And I think those were my Mm -hmm. first signs. I had so much love for my baby and I wanted to be with him, but I could not relax. And, um, I think looking back now, I think those were my earliest signs of just, of of what was to come. I wasn't really sleeping much. Miles was a cluster feeder, like 24 Mm seven. And so he was eating like every hour. And he hated being wet, right? And he hated being, yeah, yeah, he hated being wet. I remember that you went through like a million diapers. Yes, so he would pee one time and the diaper would have to go. So you know how the diapers have the like blue line on them? Some of the Mm -hmm. brands have that blue line when they're wet. We called it the blue line special. Mm. Like if they had Kmart used to have the blue light special. And so we yeah. joked, this is the blue line special. Cause like if Miles was cranky, he probably just peed and he would do this a couple times an hour. So we were going through like two or three diapers an hour just for pee. And then, you know, he would go before he ate, like as soon as he started eating, he'd have to go. Mm. And then as soon as he was done, he had to go. So it was just like this whole thing. So there was a lot of diaper changes. He also had reflux. Yes, you were the first person that told me about the rock and play, which yes. has now been recalled. Yes. But for you, it was like I a game changer because it was I, the only thing he would sleep I in. I don't care about the rock and play. I love it. I, <laughs> I, it served a beautiful purpose. I even knew, like being a nurse, and I knew I knew it wasn't like the number one, you know, best place to put my child to sleep, but he did have to sleep upright. So we had him in this, you know, upright position, and that's the only way that he would get a little bit of sleep here and there. But his sleep was maybe max 30 minutes at a time. Wow. It, it was, you That's know, like less than some babies feed for. Yeah. So he, he would literally feed and then you'd have just that, and yes. you know, just enough time to like get yourself back together. Yes, exactly. So he mm-hmm. would feed on one side for about 10 minutes or so. We'd have to keep him upright. They would want us to burp him and then put him on the other side and just go back and forth. Mm-hmm. So he wasn't getting so much of the, the sugars. So, um... Because the the more they get more sugar, I believe, as they drain, so they wanted me to be on both sides. Gotcha. Um, but then 15, 10 to fifteen minutes after each side, they wanted him to sit up for about ten minutes to burp. Right, so we wouldn't have the reflux. Yep, and we would give him. We had him on a reflux medicine. We would give him um, like baby gas X before and after he ate to try to help Aww. with the gas. Well, it was yeah. this whole um, routine, and this was. Almost every hour. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, yes. And it sounds like such a insane thing, but, like, this was our life. And I think that as I started getting into about two or three weeks was when I think I realized, like, this is my life now. <laughs> you know, I was at home. I was going to take a 12-week maternity leave. And I just realized, oh, my gosh. I Like, my, uh, my husband, after two weeks, went back to work. And I realized that I was going to be stuck at home with a baby that I couldn't put down and I could not sit down and hold him. Like he needed to be rocked um, all the time or worn and bounced. Mm -hmm. He, I could not take a shower without hearing him screaming. And, And I think some people maybe don't think so much about the screaming of a baby. If it goes on and on and on, I don't know, but I think for me, it, there was something just alarming about it for me. It, it stirred up so much anxiety for me mm-hmm. that I couldn't bear to hear it. I think it's different with each kid, too, because not that I let my kids cry a lot, but the first time you want to be quick to grab them, you don't know any different. Mm-hmm. And when you have a second one or a third one, you 
you realize that sometimes, okay, my toddler just took their poopy diaper off in the living room. I have to deal with this and the newborn will have to cry because I can't let my toddler yeah. spread poop all over the house. Yeah. So there, I just feel like it changes a little bit. But with your first one, I mean, I was the same way. And then you get, like, the phantom crying. Yeah. Like, when they're not crying, but you're so used to them crying while you're in yep. the shower that, like, you're washing your hair and you're like, are they, are they crying? Yeah. What, do, what do I hear? And sometimes I'll tell Kyle, I'll be like, go get the baby. He'll be like, they're good. Like, oh, my gosh, mm-hmm. phantom crying. Yeah. And I Googled that, and apparently it means you have a healthy brain. Fantastic, because I heard it <laughs> a lot, but I also <clears throat> heard real baby all the time. I think uh, another part of it was... Uh, he would scream and cry because of the reflux when he would nurse. So there was nothing, at least not in the first like three or four months, there was nothing soothing um, about like breastfeeding him. Like he would, he would go to, he would come to me, he would be quiet for a little bit. And then all of a sudden he would just yank off and just arch his back and just oh. scream. And I felt like I was hurting him, you know? And so I was like, how am I, how am I supposed to like, provide for my child and feed my child and listen to him scream bloody murder as I'm trying to do the best thing for him. And he was gaining weight. Like he was eating enough and right. gaining weight that we take him to the pediatrician. They say he's healthy. He's fine. He's happy. You know, he's just a difficult baby. Um, and, and I fine. kept hearing that over and over again. Wow. Sounds like he's just a difficult baby. Did this affect at this point, do you think it affected like your bonding with him? So at first, no. Um, at the very beginning, no, because I, my heart just aches for him to be okay. And Mm -hmm. I, um, I wanted to, I wanted the crying to just stop. I just wanted us to get into a routine. And I was so, I was really starting to get focused on getting into a routine. And so I delivered November 18th. By the middle of January, I realized we were not getting into a routine. There was just no way. Um, None of the books were working. People were giving me suggestions on things to do. Nothing was working. And I I was averaging a collective two hours of sleep at night, each night. And I, yeah, I realized, like, this is going to be my life. You know, I'm going to be home all day, screaming baby up all night screaming baby because I have a working husband and I'm not working and my child wouldn't take a bottle. So by the time he was allowed to, he wouldn't. And, um, we got to the point where my uh, husband at the time started sleeping in another room with the baby in there because we were told that maybe he can smell you. Maybe the baby, maybe Miles can smell me. And so that's also getting him worked up. And I thought that was like, you know, science fiction stuff. But like mm-hmm. we tried it and I would get a little bit more sleep mm-hmm. um, if he was not in the same yeah, room Yeah, like they can just kind of sense that like you're right mm-hmm. next to them. Like yes. they want you, they want a nurse. Yes. And, but then I, at the same time also couldn't sleep because I was listening for him in the other room. Mm-hmm. And I felt like, what if I don't hear him? You know, what if I don't hear him in the other room? Um, Or what if he wakes up and then he has to be brought to me? I don't want to be, you know, too groggy. Um, And I tried. I, You know, we were not in a place where we were comfortable with co-sleeping. But there was one time, I think, where I fell asleep with him in the bed. And um, that was just not okay. Uh, for me, um, I'm sure it works really well for other people, but I was just so afraid of rolling over on him or him falling out of the bed that I just couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, and he did sleep a little bit at that time, but it just, yeah. I think I was starting to go a little bit bonkers because I was not getting any sleep. You know, I think there's a reason why, why they use uh, sleep deprivation as a torture method, mm-hmm. you know, because it, it you start to hear things and see things that aren't really there, you know. Um, and I was definitely getting there. Um, I, you know, my postpartum depression, I, I started realizing there some, might be something wrong with me because I started not thinking clearly anymore. Um, I remember there was, I've told many people this, this is like my extreme story that I disclosed long after the experience, uh, Mm -hmm. because I thought that 
you know, maybe people, <laughs> you know, think I'm okay um, and not believe it. But I, there was one time where his crying, I just couldn't handle it anymore. And I packed myself a little bag and I got into my car. I put him in the crib. I l- got out of the house. I locked the doors. I got in my car and I lived right off of a, a busy highway that goes to a pretty busy interstate at the time. And uh, I got in my car and I got on the highway and I was going to leave. I was going to leave. Oh my goodness. I was, I don't know. Did I ever tell you that? No. Yeah. So I have not told many people that, but now that now, you know, cat's out of the bag, I was going to leave. No judgment here. I know yeah. like, it was a dark place. Yeah. And for anyone listening, I've actually known Meg since what, like high, high school? school? Yeah. We go way back. Yeah. So I know most of the things. So this mm-hmm. is exciting because I don't know that yeah. story. There's a lot of stuff that I did not tell people or did not feel comfortable telling people because... I, number one, didn't want them to think I was crazy, um, which is, you know, a crazy stigma in itself um, that needs to be dealt with. But I thought people would think I was crazy. I uh, thought that people would take my child away from me. Um, And then I also thought people would tell me, well, you should never have a child again. Like, you should never get pregnant again because this is what happened to you. Um, I'll get to that in a little bit. But, yeah, I got in my car. I started driving. And uh, I said, i got to get out of here because this kid is safer and healthier and happier likely with, you know, me not in the house, laying in his crib and me off somewhere else than, than if I were there being his mother. Like, I am surely not equipped. Um, I am too crazy. I am not stable enough. And I, I just can't do this right. I can't do anything right. You know, I was watching my friends around me with their babies and they're sleeping through the night and they're eating. And, I mean, people were coming into work complaining about, Oh man, I only got five hours of sleep last night because my kid, my you know, baby wouldn't sleep. And I just couldn't, I was so angry. Like I would become so bitter because I was just like, you have no idea like what I'm going through, but I wouldn't share what I was going through. And I didn't know how to ask for help anymore. Cause as, as far as I knew, mm-hmm. I had already done that and nothing was working. So I just felt stuck. So I thought there's got to be somebody who can take care of my child better than I can because I I can't. Um, I did occasionally have like thoughts of, you know, not wanting to hurt Miles, but thinking about how he'd be better off if I, if he wasn't even born or, you know, better off if I wasn't alive. Um, And luckily I did turn around. The very first exit, <laughs> the very first exit that I came to, which is only about two minutes from the house, I got off. I got turned around, came back on the highway, went back to the house, and he was, you know, fine. He was still in the crib where I left him, um, you know, kind of looking around and occupied. And um, I swore I was never going to tell anybody that. And I then I also felt guilty about that because I'm like, I'm crazy. Um, <laughs> so you never told your husband at the time? He knew afterwards, I believe, but I honestly can't remember if I ever told him that. I, you know, I think I told him. I told mm-hmm. him I packed the bag. But, yeah, I, uh, I told my family, my mother, um, after the fact. But just... <sighs> Listening to it now, it's, like, almost comical, but at the time, like, that's really scary. Oh, my gosh, it was absolutely scary. And then I couldn't yeah. believe that I did it. I could not believe that I did it. And uh, that evening when my husband at the time, when he came home, I was just a mess. And I sat him down and I said, I need to do something about this. Like, I don't, I'm not well. Um, I'm not well at all. And he said, well, do you think you're having, you know, postpartum depression? And I said, I don't know. I don't think it's that bad. (laughs) I don't think it's that bad, but I think maybe I should talk to someone And so we got an appointment the next night, I think, with my family doctor, and I told her everything, and she, not everything, by the way, but I told her mostly everything, and she just looked at me so alarmed. I remember that look on her face, that she was just so alarmed, Um, like she had never heard anything like this before. And um, she's an excellent um, provider, by the way, I still see her and I love her so much. She has helped me so much, but, um, I, yes, I remember the look on her face and I remember thinking, oh my goodness, this is bad. (laughs) They're going to send me to the psych ward. I better like tone this down a little bit. Um, and so then I, I did, I, 
convinced her, uh, along with my husband at the time who wanted me, you know, to keep breastfeeding and didn't want me to go. I don't think he really knew how bad it was, uh, either because I was holding, I was trying to hold back a little bit. I was trying not to let anybody think that I was too psychotic. And so they let me go home as long as I had 24 hour supervision. And then at that time they prescribed, um, an SSRI or an antidepressant for me to start, um, and I don't know if it was just the lack of sleep or um, the, the drop in the hormones that had been going on for some time, but I went almost manic when I started those medication or that medication mm -hmm. um, to the point of where I was not sleeping. I was up for like four or five days, um, and then I crashed and slept for like three days in a row. Oh, my gosh. So... Um, my ex-husband would just bring the baby to me to nurse. And then I don't recall any of that. I don't remember that week. I remember kind of coming out of it and being really, really foggy. And then us going to my parents' house and like sitting with them and kind of telling them that we thought that I had postpartum depression. But um, in all honesty, looking back, I, I should have been, you know, placed somewhere I should have been in a hospital away from miles away from my son I should have been separated from him and I hate like it breaks my heart to to say that or think that but I think that it could have been a lot worse than what it was mm -hmm. um I just the darkness inside of me was so intense and um just my sheer fear of of harming him or myself um was so strong like just that. and the, the idea that I wasn't even entertaining any of those thoughts um it made me sick in my stomach but that I still couldn't even I couldn't shake the thoughts you know um yeah. I think I really should have been put away but I was so terrified there was um a girl in my church growing up a woman I should say in my church growing up who had a baby and with her second one had terrible terrible postpartum depression and I remember us praying for her she was in the hospital it must have been over a month. I mean, it was like week after week after week would go by, and we were still lifting her up in prayer. She was still in the hospital in a behavioral health unit. And I remember thinking, I can't go away like that. I, I, if, the, if I go away, I'm never going to get out. I'll, I'll be there longer than her, even, I'm sure. Um, I was terrified. Um, but then... Yeah, that, I, would be, that would be really scary. You know, I, I was, and I was so afraid of being separated from my child because I was like, I'm not going to be able to bond with my baby. You know, I need to be with him. These mm -hmm. are the earliest days of his life. I, you know, I'm already breastfeeding him and, and I'm with him 24 um, seven. So yeah. I, I really should have been, but I saw an excellent counselor. Um, I told her everything she wanted to hear and she cleared me to go back to work. So I went to back to work, uh, after 14 weeks instead of 12, I got an extension, um, to go back to work and, um, I was not okay, but I was a little bit better. It was, I mean, if you know anything, like it's when you're a new mom and you are with adults, people who you can have conversations with yeah. and there's no babies around, mm -hmm. It is like... It's like life-giving. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And it was my job, but I, it didn't even matter at the time. I was so happy to just not hear a baby screaming and to be able to have a conversation. Even with my patients, um, you know, I was working in emergency medicine at the time. So I had maybe two hours max with a patient that I was caring for. But I just remember just feeling so delighted to talk to all of them. Mm -hmm. And I really took the time to have conversations with my patient instead of like, you know, moving through quickly. Um, I, I slowed myself down a bit. And I think that I was just so hungry for companionship. Um, my ex-husband and I, were we were passing ships at this point because we did not put miles in daycare. Right. Um, so we rarely saw each other. Well, because you worked the three 12 hours and then mm -hmm. you were off. Yes. And he was an EMT at the time, yes. right? So he EMT also had a similar, yeah. Yeah. similar schedule where you guys had your off days not overlapping so that Correct. one of you was almost always with, with yes. the baby. Mm -hmm. um, and then if, uh, if we weren't, then Miles would be with his grandmother. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, yeah, we 
we were never seeing each other. And um, so my the people that I communicated with and talked to were my coworkers and and my patients. And then I would, you know, I'd come home and I was too exhausted. Um, I'm too, I was too busy with the screaming baby and too terrified right. to go out with the screaming baby that I barely even saw my friends. I mean, you probably, we've talked about it before, I think, um, how, you know, we would go through periods of time where we wouldn't hang out or wouldn't see each other. And you and a lot of people would just assume, I'm sure, that everything is fine. You yeah. know, no news is good news. Right. And all this time, I was just, like, stuck in this dark hole. And I didn't know how to get out of it. And I didn't know how to ask for help to get out of it. Yeah. I remember being worried when you had said you were taking an extension and you weren't going back to work as soon. And when you had said something about like Luke taking more time off. Yeah. But the way you conveyed everything, whether it was just text or like when we did talk, you were very good about like seeming pulled together. Yeah. And you were very good about, um, I don't know, just seeming like it wasn't as big of a deal. Yeah. And in hindsight, like as a friend, I feel bad that I didn't just stop by and I didn't just say like, I'm going to come bring you coffee. Right. But I feel like you also, you never know when someone has a baby, you want to respect their privacy too. And you want to make sure they have that family time. And I think from the outside, I thought the time that Luke had taken off um, to be home more, I thought maybe it was really just because the baby like needed more care. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I don't even know. But it is hard from the outside looking in to know. Mm -hmm. I mean, in hindsight, like, how would you, like, would you have just been more honest about it? What do you think you would do now if this was, a, you know, if a second time around you were just feeling overwhelmed? Yeah. Um, for a second time around, knowing what I know now, I would actually run my postpartum period totally differently than what yeah. I did the first time. Um, I would have set myself up with a more secure well with just more people in general like that's one of the biggest thing like they they said after I've heard so many people say that you know after you have a child like it takes a it takes a village to raise a child well it takes a village to support a mother too and I think I didn't know that at the time but I think that that is what I needed like I look I now would spend more time um, you know, reaching out to other women and, and just not secluding myself. Mm -hmm. Um, I know now that I absolutely have to ask for more help that like the silence from me is, you know, it prompts people to think that everything's fine and it just wasn't. And, um, so I don't know. I think in hindsight, that is what I would do differently. That is what I needed. It's time for our review of the week. At Jill Stolzfus left this sweet comment about our show. These ladies are entertaining, fun, and easy to listen to. It's like you're a part of the conversation. They keep it real and their episodes have nuggets of helpful tips to help working moms thrive. We want to say thank you to each of our listeners. And if you haven't taken the time to leave us a review, be sure to tell us what you think. Rachel and I read each comment and every comment we receive on iTunes and Instagram, and they all mean so much to us. Yeah, I think too, even um, like you were saying, like the your, your signs and symptoms were like the withdrawing. Mm -hmm. And so maybe from the outside, if you have a friend that has a baby and you notice they're really just not themselves with wanting to see you, wanting to get out... Um, Maybe then it's time to just say, hey, like, how are you really doing? Absolutely. And if we can get any message across today, I think that one of the big reasons you wanted to do this, because I've asked you about doing an episode like a few times mm -hmm. and probably like a handful of months ago. And I love that you reached back out to me and were like, I think I'm in a really good place to do this. Because mm -hmm. this is like a deep topic and it's something that's very vulnerable. And I think the reason you want to do it is because you wanted to let other people know like it's not out of the ordinary like the stats sh like the stats show like I think it's one out of nine women have mm -hmm. postpartum depression and those are just the one out of nine that sought help and were diagnosed exactly because up to 80 percent they say have the baby blues yeah. and I was one of those people like if if I hadn't had the support or you know if things had been a little bit different for me like I could have easily been diagnosed myself yeah, of because course. I remember feeling like it was a roller coaster and for me it was not the withdrawing it was like the crying mm -hmm. like I 
I mean, if I had withdrawn, I think people would have known something's wrong. Oh my gosh, I'm like, oh my gosh, so outgoing. (laughs) But um, I just remember, like, it was like when I did have alone time. Like, somebody could literally be at my house almost all day, and I would have an hour until my husband got home. And in that hour, like, it was like somebody, like my mom leaving my house after like folding all my laundry and being there all day. Like, my baby could be sleeping, but she would leave, and I would feel like I was like the most alone person in the world, and I would cry. Yeah. And. That's just not normal. Yeah. Like, you've got an hour to yourself. Enjoy that. <laughs> that was one of the other huge things, too. Like, people, on the, the times that I would allow people, because I don't want to make it seem like nobody showed up. I didn't even give anybody an opportunity to show up. You know, people would ask me if I was okay, if I needed anything, and I would say no. You know, I would say no. And then I'd be, you know, eyeballs deep in laundry and dishes and covered in my own, you know, uh, breast milk everywhere and realizing I hadn't showered in eight days and I would be so overwhelmed, but I just had this idea in my head that I needed to do it on myself. Like, this is nature. Like, my body knows what it's doing. My, you know, I am a, a woman, I'm a mother, and I, this should just come naturally. And the only thing that came naturally to me was, like, feeling uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. It, I, I wanted to love the experience, and I wanted to just almost will myself to be having a blast but I was so consumed with fear and anxiety I remember there was one time you and I we went we were going to the mall just to walk the kids like it was the winter so we were just going to stroll and walk you know we were still you know strollering um Reagan and I remember it took me two hours to get ready I started early because I knew that I was going to have trouble leaving the house and it's not because it took me uh, like two hours to get dressed or pack a bag or get everything ready for the baby. It was just for me to get myself to be uh, confident enough to walk out of my house and get into my car and drive to the mall. I, my heart would just race. I would like sweat profusely. I'd have to change my clothes. Um, and I just shake and I just was so terrified of leaving my house. Like it was so overwhelming. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, that, that is one of the biggest things. Like you said, just let people help you. You know, I was so afraid that somebody was going to come over and do something the wrong way and I had to have to fix it all over again. Or I felt like I was inconveniencing people by asking for help. And I felt like I should be able to do this myself. And that's not even just a a postpartum thing for me. Like that is me as a person. I am, I was just raised to be a do it yourself. You know, you should be able to do this. And if you can't figure out a way, you know, to do it. And that has been how I, I've been my entire life. And so my pregnancy and my postpartum period just kind of brought all that out in me so much more strongly. And it wasn't until, um, you know, I actually, I don't, I'm not going to really cover this too much here, but you know, I, I am in recovery. Um, and it wasn't that that happened actually after miles, like I say miles saved my life because, you know, I did have, um, an experience with addiction that, also, I believe, went back before um, I had Miles. But in recovery and in um, my marriage kind of falling apart and just kind of growing, and as, as time went on and Miles grew up, I started noticing um, that I am very much uh, the type of person who feels like I need to be in control or, or have some sort of idea that I'm in control. And... That asking for help means that I am weak and it's completely the opposite. You know, I think there's a great strength in being able to admit that you aren't able to do everything yourself, Mm -hmm. you know, and that you're not inconveniencing somebody who wants to help you. Let someone help you. Yeah. Ask for help. Ask for that extra hand. Like we're not supposed to be doing this by ourselves. Not at all. I definitely think to the control thing. I mean, I'm type A. I can really, it took me a while to like accept that like, our mother's helper doesn't always fold our things exactly the way I would yeah. fold them. But she is wonderful, and I am, like, just happy to have somebody help. Yeah. And you know what else I've learned? If you like your towels a certain way, like, you can just tell somebody. Yeah. Hey, girl, we fold our towels in thirds. Yep. And if they want to help you, they will not be offended that, like, you are telling them how to do something. Yeah. I think someone will appreciate that. 
For sure. Um, so yeah, the, some of the things I would kind of point out to like moms who are expecting, like if this is your first, or even if this isn't your first, postpartum depression can come in any pregnancy. It doesn't have to be your first pregnancy. I just, you know, I hit the lottery, you know? So, um, but just have some love and acceptance for yourself and just let people help you. Um, something that I'm doing and, and I would highly suggest for other women, uh, not doing, I'm not pregnant yet, but I plan on doing because I have family out of the area and um my some of my a lot of my family members still work full-time is um you know getting into like I'm, I'll be looking into a postpartum doula like somebody to come over maybe the week after or the two weeks after who's yeah. able to help kind of you know do a little bit of cooking a little bit of cleaning help support me in that way and support my you know um spouse at that time um just has the extra tips and experience you know um I plan to be on um, something for depression. Um, there, there are side effects, you know, possible birth defects that can occur, you know, with being on any really medication. A lot of medications have that risk. Um, but some of the post... Sorry, guys. We dropped the pacifier. Oh, Passy down. Let's be real here. We already warned you that we're recording oh, yeah. with kids today. Oh, yeah. There's so, I'm sure there's so many noises in the background here, but, you know, that's life. That's yeah. Really if not. there were bodily functions happening, it wasn't us. It's not us. I this, promise. This baby of mine has gone through, like, three diapers, so mm. just, uh, just a disclaimer. But Episode 17 here. He's super precious. <laughs> been a gassy one. He's so gassy, but he's so precious. <laughs> He's allowed to do whatever he wants. Um, yeah, I uh, I plan on having some sort of a, a antidepressant on board um, later in the pregnancy. Just you know, it minimizes greatly minimizes any sort of risk of birth defects. But surely uh, there is nothing uh, clinically against being on it your entire pregnancy. There are so many women who oh, do yeah. who do take it, have had no problems, and it's actually built up a really really good. Um, I don't even know really what the word would be, but it's in your body long enough that you are, you're going into your postpartum period when the hormones drop and when you're going through that experience, you already have that reserve kind of build up. I think that's the word I was looking for. But oh, yeah. I mean, shout out. They're probably not going to pay me any money, but I have been open that um, Lexapro is the drug that I've been on. That was the one and, that I utilized too. Yeah. yeah and it was... I think they said it was like a class C where like there's not quite enough research to say it's totally safe, but it's not like exactly. a don't take it during pregnancy. It's very much a, if you need it, it's more important to take it mm -hmm. than to not take it. Absolutely. If you don't need it, like if it's not, you know, if you don't have terrible anxiety or depression, then obviously, you know, there are some, some risks. So then don't take it. But, mm -hmm. um, you do need to put yourself first because if you can't be a good mom, you're not going to have a healthy baby. So... So there's that, mm -hmm. and I am more than happy to answer any questions. I love getting your messages on Instagram or whatever, um, you know, Facebook us, um, about anxiety, about depression, just because it's a real thing, and you're not the only one dealing with it. I think to, to close, I think for me, because uh, a lot of people talk about or ask me about my bonding with my child after the fact, after all of this kind of, because it did come to a head, and things got better. So um, yeah. that is the upside. It gets better. But ask for help. Reach out. Um, Miles did eventually start sleeping through the night. Um, terrified me at first because I was like, there's something wrong with my baby. I got to check on him because yeah. he's being way too quiet. Um, the reflux, he grew out of the reflux. His little, you know, teeny tiny GI tract became so sophisticated that now it won't stop eating pancakes. Um, <laughs> and he's just incredible. I will say, I think... The bonding issues are more um, up in my head than anything mm -hmm. because I still go through periods where I do feel some guilt or shame and, and I feel afraid that like something about that whole experience um, affected our bonding. Like, oh, maybe, maybe we could be better bonded if... You know, if I hadn't gone through this, but this kid, he's amazing. Like we have such an incredible relationship. Yeah, he's a big snuggler. You know, he's just your relationship the is no different. Oh my It's no different than a mom that had an easy baby. Yeah, I mean, he some days. I mean, he's like completely attached to the hip, and we just have a blast. And then some days he's independent and does his own thing. You know, um, so. I think a lot of the bonding stuff is, you know, the stories, the narratives that I've created in my head, 
you know, making me kind of afraid that something happened. But I, you know, it's, we have a beautiful relationship and, um, tell us about your romantic relationship ah, too. Just yeah. because you've talked about how, um, yes. with all the things that happened and then, um, some of the addiction things that you were yes. going through as well, um, your marriage crumbled and it yes. was not just a result of, of those things either. There was a whole yes. lot. That's a whole so, other story. Absolutely. Um, it takes two to tango. Oh, I'll yes. Say. But, yes, it does. <laughs> but I feel like not only have things worked out so well for you just personally and in your personal growth and in your bonding with Miles, but romantically, I feel like you were in a better place as well. Yeah. With someone that just compliments you in a way that your ex-husband just never did. Yeah. And I think that's something that's okay to be open about as well. You know, um, not every relationship works out as much as we want it to. Um, sometimes mm-hmm. I think both people need to go yeah. in a different direction. Yeah, for sure. So you keep talking about how for next time. Yeah. Well, there will be next two. time. Yeah, there will be next time. There's not, it's not happening right now. Disclaimer. Um, but yeah, no, I think the, uh, the Pete, my my boyfriend now, um, you know, we are very very committed, and um, we just have this like incredible compatibility that um, I never knew you could have with someone um, when you're in a relationship. We've been together about um, around two ish years or so, um, mm-hmm. and we both are just so. Um, excited to have a family and to grow the family. You know, he's taken to Miles. Miles has taken to him so well. They're buddies, and um, and it's just such a cool thing to watch them together. Mm-hmm. For me, it just just like overfill like ugh, overflows my heart. To I don't even yeah. I can't even explain it. Well, from the outside too, it's just <laughs> it's so cute to see you guys, but also just to see like you said like his relationship with Miles and just your family now versus your family then. Yes, and you know. In God's time, I think everything happens the way yes, it should. Yes, I, I um, so agree. But I just think, too, that good things good things come when you're in a good place. Yeah. You know, when you're in a bad place, you're not attracting positive things. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you get yourself healthy, when you get yourself in that place, you're able to welcome a healthy relationship. Yeah. I just feel like you're such a walking example of that. Yeah, thank you. I Thanks. Yeah, no, we... Um, I have to say, I'm sure Pete puts up with a lot with me, for sure. Um, we put up with each other. We, <laughs> I have to say, we, um, you know, we're human beings, but we have a lot, a lot of fun. And I think one of the biggest things that I had to do for our relationship was just being very open and honest about what I went through. And at first I thought it was going to scare him off, but he seems to be pretty unfazed by it all. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and he seems to still be pretty excited about the prospect of us having a family together. And so it's something we've definitely talked about, something that I, I'm sure will be a reality in the near future. <laughs> you know, I, um, yeah, we, I don't want to, you know, say too much or anything, but there, I don't want to like... wedding bells in the horizon? Ah! Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, yeah, there are, (laughs) there are, uh, there in the horizon, you know, the very near future there are. Um, so I guess I just outed myself on this now. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're getting married. Um, oh my goodness. I didn't mean to out you. No, it's okay. It is out. (laughs) Um, yeah, we just kind of been talking about it with close family and friends, but there, yeah, yeah. So All of this, um, you know, is something that has been on my mind and my heart and in my prayers, you know, very recently because, um, you know, I kind of am am looking at very soon, you know, growing my family. And so I really, um, it it kind of brings a lot of it back um, and thinking about that and and me thinking about what I wouldn't do differently this time, um, Mm -hmm. you know, also makes me realize, like, what I have to offer other other women, um, and in, in addition, uh, part of the other reason that I felt it so important to share was because you know in the day age of social media, um, we have the ability to have multiple conversations with multiple people whenever we want. You know, you can just go on Instagram or I don't use Facebook currently, but I, I used to. I have one. I just don't use it, but. Um, I've had so many women reach out to me in the past few years for 
um, advice or for help or just um, for someone to talk to because they're going through um, mm-hmm. postpartum depression or they think they might be or they're going they're having trouble um, you know with fertility and they knew that I had had a miscarriage because I've been very vocal about that um, and how that all played in I mean my miscarriage was such a huge component of my postpartum depression because I remember thinking I wanted this baby so bad how dare I feel this way mm-hmm. you know I can't believe I I must be so ungrateful. And it's just not that. That's not the reality, but I felt it. And so um, I've been just wanting to be available to more women who who have questions or yeah. need somebody to be, you know, they need to talk to somebody about how they just really, you know, like to drop their baby back off at the hospital. <laughs> um, again, you know, just put it back for a little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so. Where can people find you if they would want to get connected or just talk about any of these issues so i i live in lancaster area i do have an instagram it's at m done 1018 i my account is private but you can still message me and i can still accept um messages and we can get you know we can touch base that way and i'm always looking for you know more people that i can kind of network with and help so you know we can be friends but (laughs) um yeah i for first a certain professional and then some other personal reasons i have a private account um yeah understandable but you have been through a lot yes yes and i you know i have a full-time career and you know so i like to keep i try to keep my family and my life you know separate from my job and and so that's just one of the ways i can do it but i'm available i'm certain you can search for me and message me uh i work second shift so i'm up until like 4 a.m so i'm pretty easily (laughs) reachable friend i text when i'm like up at night breastfeeding yeah you know 3 a.m hey yeah how's it going yeah i'll I'll play tomorrow (laughs) yeah i'll i'll marco polo you on my drive home at 3 30 in the morning you know if you need something um, I always try to make myself available. I think one of the other things I've done is just been trying to be more present in the lives of my friends who have had babies, you know, asking them, do you need anything? And then if they say no, I don't take no for an answer. I'm, I'm like that person now. Um, <laughs> hey, I appreciate it. I think that's, that's just so important. It's, mm-hmm. it's great that you do that. And Thank you so much for sharing your story yeah, today. Yeah, absolutely. Sure thing. I have to, I have to bring up my, um, Oh, gosh. What do you guys call it? Your, um... What? Oh, gosh. When you, like, don't like something. Oh, our or favorite you, or our love yeah. it or don't. We I haven't done a love it or don't in a while. Oh, gosh. Because I wanted to tell you how much I don't love something, but I'll just not do it. <laughs> no, no. That is it. We always have time. We always have time for a love it or don't. Oh, my gosh. I just... I was thinking about this today because I was looking at my bathtub. I, this is, like, to take this from, you know, the... the you know, serious topic to like a r- ridiculously petty topic, I think. But so, okay. I, I love Lush. You actually turned me on to Lush. Like I, yes. it's a problem. Like the you beauty all, store, you, they sell bath bombs. Well, they yeah. sell soaps. It's all like organic. Well, you planted the seed and I was like definitely a non-believer at the time for sure. And then Pete got me some stuff for Mother's Day. I think it was last year. And I was like super skeptical. I was like, well, I don't want to like hurt his feelings. So I guess I'll use it. And <laughs> I'm addicted now. I got this bath bomb. And this is like a public service announcement, I got to say. Okay. <laughs> but the, I got this bath bomb they had. It's newer. It's called Black Rose. And it's like, it looks like something from like Sleeping Beauty. It's like this black ball with like this red glittery, you know, Ooh. these red glittery petals. Gorgeous. You drop it in your tub and it turns the water totally jet black. I mean, you feel like you're like, it's like the grudge. Oh. Okay. But it smells so amazing. Okay. But it's like officially like the grudge because you drain your tub and it stains your tub. Oh no. Okay. And I'm just, I'm so frustrated right now because I, that's like my project right now. I've been scrubbing my tub. So definitely. That's a good guys, love it. Like you love the bath bomb, but you don't love yes. the after effects. Yes. So yeah. Love it and don't love it. I don't know. I just had to drop that in there. No, that's a really good one. Now I feel like I need to think of one. I mean, gosh, there's a lot of things I love and a lot of things I don't. Mm. I've had the same issue with their bath bombs because they're the nice ones. Like, it's the kids love that they turn water different colors. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the things I love is that I have a cleaning lady now. Mm. It's only because I'm, I'm doing a trade. I am uh, helping a friend who has a cleaning business design yeah. a new website. So the thing I love is when you can do a trade with somebody that needs a service that you offer and you need their service. So that's a love. Um, I don't know if my don't is like on a flip side. Like, hmm. 
because there's just a, that's a win-win for both yeah. people. Um, a thing I don't love is when the cleaning ladies come and the very next day my kids like make the house all dirty. Mm. So that maybe that's my don't. Yeah, what's the point this of morning? Oh. Yeah, this morning I woke up and Reagan was like, "Look, mom, I have a worm." <laughs> That was a real worm? Her. Yes! She had a real worm in the house. Mm-hmm. She, my mom got her this little, like, bug catcher kit. Oh, no. And I told them it was for outside only, and I was in the shower, and she brought it into, uh, into my bathroom and was like, look, Mom, it's a girl. That's what she said to me. It's a girl. Mm-hmm. Yep. Aww. And then I heard her say, I'm going to go put it in the sunshine. <laughs> oh. So I don't know if the girl worm is, is, is going to make it. It's, oh... Yeah. We haven't had anything like that happen with Miles yet. He's pretty, like, in his books and his cars. We have had a yogurt car wash mm. that, you know, liquid, you know, the drinkable yogurts all over yeah. my carpet and stuff. I heard but, about that. Yeah, yogurt car wash is not a success. Well, we're into bugs right now. Yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Grandma, for the bug catchers, you know, like the little nets. Yep. Oh, you yeah. get them in, like, the dollar section or whatever. Yeah. And then, like, the little container you keep them in has, like, a magnifier glass to see them. Uh-huh. So we'll see what they have when I come home because our babysitter is always doing fun things with them. Oh. Like, catching more bugs. Oh, my gosh. Love well, it. On that note, thank you for listening. Be sure to find us online. You can visit rachelkleincreative.com for all things the Thrive Podcast. You can check out our recent interviews. Megs will be available shortly, and be sure to find her on Instagram at mdunn1018. And thank you again for sharing your story. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right. Bye, guys. Thank you so much for listening today. You are a part of a growing community of moms, business owners, and women who are here to encourage and inspire. You can connect with Rachel at Rachel Klein Creative on Instagram or rachelkleincreative.com. To keep up with Christine and her latest events, follow her business journey on Instagram at Bellamberry Co. And if you want to be first to know about upcoming guests and giveaways, sign up for the Thrive Podcast email list today. Simply visit rachelkleincreative.com slash the Thrive Podcast or follow at the Thrive Podcast on Instagram. If you've enjoyed listening this week or you've already added our show to your favorites playlist, we'd love for you to write us a review on iTunes. Your support and positive feedback allows us to keep encouraging moms and business owners each week.